Oh, he said, I gotta go. They, they're calling me. So, you know, and that was just before they, they were finished, well, while they were finishing up the movie. Gooding, Clash Terrell, mm -hmm. 2012, I promoted Red Tails with George Lucas. Yeah, so my son, he said George Lucas was there. Yeah, so well, you, you might have met my son. You might have seen him out there standing around. Started, whatever. Started, well, I, I have a thing uh, with the South. Because when I took my basic training, I saw I'd never go south again. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's get set up. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm rolling. Oh, you're rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. Man. Right, so we're, we're at the home of uh, Mr. Julius Freeman in Queens, um, a Tuskegee Airman, um, who, like many of the airmen, and we never knew anything about it. I, I knew a Tuskegee Airman who lived near my office and didn't find out till about maybe eight years ago that he was an airman. And uh, in speaking to Mr. Mulzak, he didn't want to talk about the war. He didn't want to talk about the historical aspect of being a Tuskegee Airman. Um, but we're, we're grateful to be here in your house, to allow us to come in, not only to meet you, but to see all of the memorabilia that, that is here. This is a veritable museum and a tribute to what you and other black men um, did during the Second World War when others said you couldn't do it. Um, before we get into the, the aspects of the, the Corps and your subsequent life, give us a little background on your early years growing up, your parents and, and things of that nature. Well, I was born in the city of Lexington, Kentucky. Born April 9th, 1927. In those days in Kentucky, people of color was considered nothing. You know, as far as the world was concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, you had such thing back in those days as enrich. Not just in the main <coughs> word, but in. I think everyone recognizes the word in. And fortunately, at the beginning, my family was pretty well off. There was uh, total sound. Yes, um, so back to Kentucky. In yes. those days, uh, people of color was the bottom of the rail. Mm. Uh, but we were pretty well off. Uh, each one of my aunts, they were in their own home, which was unusual in those days, but then death happened, and they ended up losing their home. Sure. So I ended up going from one aunt to the other, and I you know, we'll forget in 34, one aunt died at night. The next morning, the other aunt was on her way to work, and she passed waiting for a bus. Oh. Hmm. And I recall the two hearses going 12 miles because they were originally from a town called Lancaster, Kentucky. And this was in Lexington, Kentucky, 12 miles away. And two ambulances took them back to their hometown to be buried. And uh, from then I had to, uh, was on my own. Hmm. I picked you up were a child. Yeah, I was a kid. Yeah. From the time I was seven years of age, I was on my own. I had a house that I paid seven dollars a month for a railroad house. A railroad house, I assume you know what a railroad yes, house I is. Lived in a <laughs> you walk in the house, it's a living room, bedroom, kitchen. It's a railroad. And that was seven dollars a month. In order to get seven dollars a month, I I was set up picking up liquor bottles. Some to the moonshine because it was a dry state. You couldn't right. buy them. So you had a lot of moonshiners. And I would go and pick up empty bottles and sell them for a penny apiece. I would go to, went around to the white person neighborhood and I found a buggy. I took the four wheels off and the axle got me a box and made me a wagon. Took another piece of wood put a bolt to it, made a steering wheel, put a rope on that, I'd go out and pick 
pickup iron, rags, loan them anything, and then pull it to the junkyard and sell them for a penny a pound. Mm. That was the way I lived from the time of seven to 1941. The war started December 7, 1941, and there was a man that lived in the country at a farm. His mother had had a stroke, and Uncle Sam drafted him. So the people said, well, you know, there's a little boy down the street living by himself. Why don't you talk to him and see if he can go and live with your mother and help her out? His name was Reuben Smallwood. He came to me and he said, uh, you know, I got to go in service and uh, I would like you to come live in my house and help my mother out. So I went to the country and I started to milk cows and raise pigs and doing farm work. Then as I got to know the people, I started working for the white farmers for 50 cents a day, 12 hours a day. 50 cents a day, 12 hours a day. And uh, after they did that, I started working for someone else, milking their cows and things of that nature. And uh, then my uncle, by marriage, one of my aunt did out. He came and asked me would I like to come to Lexington to live. And I said yes. So he brought me back from Lancaster to Lexington. And I started working for John Ott's grocery store, riding a bicycle delivering groceries. A mm. dollar and fifty cents a week. That was big money. Oh, big money. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, the war started. That 1939 Chevrolet delivery panel truck. The guy who was driving that was drafted. So the guy said to me, Would you like to deliver from bike? I said, Yes. So I started driving the truck hmm. and delivering groceries. Soon after that, about a year later, I was on my 17th birthday, realizing that the next year I was going to be drafted. I didn't want to go into the Army because in those days, every black person basically was going into the Army and foxholes and things like that. Yeah. So I volunteered for the Air Force. And there was a mix-up. They still put me in the Army. Hmm. And I served two days in the Army in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And I started questioning them why I was in the Army, so I got a very nice lieutenant that changed me out. They gave me a discharge in two days and I re-enlisted in the Air Force. They sent me to Wichita Falls, Texas, which is uh, Shepherdville Air Force Base. That's why I took my basic training. And uh, we had race rides there. And they shipped us out from Shepherdville, Texas to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Green in uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina, which was still bad. Were, were the race riots in, in Texas, Texas, were they on the base or were the they base. in the What happened, they had a Westfield and Eastfield. The blacks was on the west side and the whites was on Eastfield. And they got into a competition, got into a race riot. A couple of people were killed. And they put heps on our folders and sent us to Goldsboro, North Carolina, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. They kept us there for about four days. They shipped us back to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, and we were there for about a week. And they shipped us to Staten Island. <laughs> and from Staten Island, woke up one morning, got on trucks, took us to the dock, put us on a ship. Uh, Ten days later, I landed in La Havre, France, Camp Philip Marsh, La Havre, France. Still under segregation because we'd been on the ocean so long we were young kids, and we all wanted to go to Paris. We'd heard about Paris and everything. <laughs> so some of us went way AWOL. And they had 50 cal machine guns on the Jeep. And they ta 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 halt! They shoot first and holler halt. A couple of guys got killed, and uh, after we stayed there for three months, then
then they load us in boxcars and shipped us to Germany. And I ended up in Rock, Germany. And that's where it began to have a little peace because I'm a medical technician in West 409. And I ran a, a, a purpose life station. That's when the guys been on town got to come and clean themselves up. I ran a station. Then I had the opportunity of leaving that and going into managing a nightclub, AES Snack Bar, which was fantastic there because I had 15 German girls, six Belgium girls, and three French girls, and seven Polacks because the Polak was against the United States at one time. And if they lost, they take their un our uniforms and dye them purple and put a PW in them, and they had to do our work, dirty work. So I need the, them to do the KP and stuff in the club. So I was there for about three, two years, and then I got a Pledges officer came in, and he didn't like the idea that I was had a German girlfriend. So he pulled me out of the station, sent me to Landsberg, Germany, defused and under, unexploded bombs. Because of bomb. So you went from being a corpsman as a medic to running a nightclub to dealing with ordnance. Yeah. Without any With no training? No training. <laughs> What he was trying to do... Get you killed. <laughs> you didn't have to go to the front line. Yeah, then Doc did good because what we had to do... You got to take the they, nose of the... And screw the thing right. very carefully. And you make sure you take those wires apart without touching them. Because if you did, boom! We lost a couple of guys that way. So anyway, I'm glad he did it. Because by him doing that, I'm able to get 100%. Disability? Huh? 100% what? Veterans. Veterans benefits. And because what happened, uh, naturally, by going there, he had no business sending me there without training. You got to be right. trained. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But he wanted me to be killed. And this is what I fought the VA about. Okay. This is how I won my 100% disability because. And uh, after that, they sent me back to the States at Lockburn Air Force Base where I joined Colonel Benjamin O. Davis. The Benjamin O. Davis. Yes. Wow. And at that point, I became a trustee gamer. So wait, let me, this, this, Pat, I know you didn't mention anything about school in your early years because you were always working and, yeah. and so how did you handle everything that I've done with the ninth grade education? I speak to the kids today and tell them that the things that I've accomplished was only a ninth grade education. I tell the kids, if they stay in school and get an education, think of what they can do. Mm -hmm. And I've done some great things, people would say. i designed cars. I've shown cars at the New York Coliseum for 14 years. I uh, have been involved with being with the president. I had the Congressional Gold Medal for President of the United States. I had breakfast with Obama on January 20, 2009. And I tell the kids this. I said, look, if I did all this with a ninth grade education back in the 40s when no one wanted you to have an education, what should you do today? Right. Amen. That's my speech to the kids today. I said that yesterday at Jet Blue. And I tell the kids that at all times. And I tell them, you know, uh, there's an old saying, lift yourself up by your boots, saying, that's not where it's at. Lift yourself up by your mind. That's Amen. what it's at. That's, right. that's what I tell the kids each and every day when I speak. Okay, so you got shipped back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. You wound up then... Lockburn Air Force Base under Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Benjamin o. Davis. Tuskegee Davis. Airmen. I, then I started my field at 409 as a medical technician. So that was where you got your first real training in the field to do anything really right. everything else you had done on your own wit and, right. and, and your own mental capabilities that's correct so you became a corpsman medical technician right. um, 
tell us the, the, the job itself, because people think, you know, we hear about Tuskegee Airmen and we automatically think about pilots. Yeah. Well, but there's more than a pilot much on a crew to a plane. Well, Could you give us all, that? At the beginning, what I also tell the kids, Tuskegee was an accident. It was something that was not supposed to be. Mm. Not supposed to be successful. The NAACP, the Urban League, uh, Chicago Defender, in 1941, they pressured President Roosevelt to build a field to train black men how to fly. And they chose Tuskegee. The field of Tuskegee started in 1891. Uh, ben, uh, Booker T. Washington was a slave. Mm -hmm. When he was freed, he decided he wanted to start a college. Sure. Went to this field and he wanted to buy it. They wanted five hundred dollars for it. He did not have five hundred dollars, so his colleagues and himself went around the country to raise two hundred fifty dollars to put put the two fifty they already had. They paid five hundred dollars for Tuskegee. Okay. When they did that, there was thirty students and one building. But from 19, from 1891 to 1941, the place had changed to 3,500 students and 165 buildings. That's gross. That's what gross. had happened, the students worked at daytime, went to school at night. They grew cotton, tobacco, corn, made bricks, and sold them to the neighbors and built the 165 building. Mm -hmm. okay, at that time is when they changed the field into Tuskegee Training Field. If you were, it was called the Tuskegee Experiment, mm -hmm. something that was supposed to fail, because in 1925, the United States government had made a survey and wrote a statement that people of color when they used Negroes, was not equivalent to a white man. Right. And that they were lazy, they were independent, they could not do anything or handle anything that was technical. We were shiftless and we wouldn't fight. Mm -hmm. That was written by the government of the United States. Okay. So what happened, Booker T, I mean, Colonel Davis had went to West Point for four years. No one spoke to him. He had to eat alone, sleep alone, and they had no connection with him other than the classes. But he, they wanted to wash him out, but he was determined not to be washed out. And he carried that right on in to the Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. because we all appreciated so one to think, just think of being in a place for four years and had to be completely alone except when you're in class. That's a rough thing. And we appreciate him for that. And that's one of the reasons that Tuskegee Cam was so successful. Because they appreciated the things that their leader had endured during his life. So actually when they did give us planes, they had three planes to make one that would be operative would fly. And only after, prior to this, the Tuskegee Airmen was not in the war. Their job was to fly around beaches and blow up trains and uh, railheads and things of that nature. They would not let them fight in the war. Mm -hmm. Only after they had sent 365 plane bombers to bomb Berlin, the Germans shot down 85 of them, 10 men per plane, do the math. Whew. Okay. Wow. At that time, Roosevelt ordered uh, Davis to come to Washington, and he said to him, you've been a good job because the Tuskegee Airmen had been flying so often that they knew their planes like everything mm -hmm. because they were not in the war. They did was fly and learn. 
And it's like anything else, if you're driving a car every day and going on a route, you learn how to handle that car. Well, it's the same thing that happened with the Tuskegee, but it was superior to the other guys who flew planes because they didn't have the experience that Tuskegee Airmen guys had had. So anyway, uh, he says, can you, you've been doing a beautiful job. Is it possible you could escort the bombers to bomb Berlin? Mm -hmm. So David told him, well, if you give us new planes, because you've been giving us hand down planes, we'll assure you that we'll be able to escort them. Well, now what? The reason there, no one, no one else was able to do this, they were self-concerned. The Germans were smarter than the whites were because what would happen, they'd have the bombs going, the Germans would send 20 planes in, the Americans would see the 20 planes and each one of them would fly off to kill and shoot down a German. Meantime, the bombs were all by, by themselves, themselves and they were shot out of the sky. So when Davis came back here and meeting with the guy, I said, look, we've been assigned to escort the bombs and I want you to stick with the he heavies because if any of you fly off to get a kill, keep on flying because when you come back, you're going to be court-martialed. So what the Tuskegee Airmen would do, the bombers would say this year, they had Tuskegee Airmen planes here, Tuskegee Airmen planes there, Tuskegee Airmen over here, and Tuskegee Airmen underneath. Mm -hmm. When the Germans came in, they didn't fly off to kill them. They shot them down. Roscoe Brown. Roscoe Brown, yeah, in Manhattan, right. With a P-51, shot down the first ME-262 ME jet. Who'd ever think that a prop plane could shoot down a jet plane? But Roscoe did. And the way he did it, the guy was coming in, going to try to lock on to Roscoe. He dropped the guy over shot, Roscoe came up. He came up behind him. Blew him out of the sky. They lost five jet planes to jet Tuskegee Airmen when they was coming over. Five of them they lost. We had one guy who was an ace, his name was uh, uh, Lee Archer. He, an ace, you had to shoot out five planes to become an ace. He was the only ace we had. Hmm. But during the raid in Berlin, we lost 66 Tuskegee Airmen who shot out. But all of the bombers made it. Hey, welcome back. I'm Grant Weatherspoon. Now, Winston is behind the camera, and we're at the home of Mr. Julius Freeman, Tuskegee Airman, automobile salesman, public speaker, motivator. Uh, we're here. We're blessed to be here in his home in Queens, getting his uh, life story. Um, at this point, you had mentioned that you do speak with children and you go to schools. Um, what, what are the things that you see that kids me, need most today? Mainly, the children need to. Oh no, that's not, that's not on. Oh, it's not. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mainly, they need to learn about their history. I find that they know nothing of their history. They, uh, when I speak to them, I speak to them about Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver. I ask them, do they realize about the peanuts and the things that he did with peanuts? And in most cases, they do not know. They've heard of Booker T. Washington, but they don't know the story of Booker T. Washington. One of the great things that any person of color should be proud of is the things that Booker T. Washington did, such as starting Tuskegee Institute. But I inform them of the day, not of the past, but what they should be doing, staying in school, get an education, because education is the greatest thing. You are our future. I'm the past. Stay in school, get an education. When you think of what you want to do, make sure that this is what you wish to do in life and that this will carry you through life and sustain you through life. And once you've decided that this is what you want to do, let no one turn you around. You know, we have an old saying from the past, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. 
but that's not J.T. Freeman's statement. Pull yourself up by your mind. That's where it's at. If you use your mind intelligently and do the things that you feel that you want to do, but don't play games with yourself. Be sincere. Mm -hmm. Be honest. Yeah. Be honest and make sure this is what you wish to do. And once you do that, let no one turn you around. Mm -hmm. This is my statement that I make every day when I speak to the students. And I hope that they will absorb what I've said to them. And I sincerely hope that if I can only save 10 people, Mm -hmm. I will feel that I've done a good job. That is my statement to the youth of today. And you'll be how old on your next birthday? My next birthday, I'll be 89 years of age. Okay. Right. It's okay. So you're, you're well beyond the, the, the three score and ten. Yes, yes. And I used to tell my grandmother she must be stealing time off of somebody else's chart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but as long as it wasn't mine, it was okay. Right. You know. But uh, especially for our youth, uh, a lot of young folks are throwing their lives away yes. far well, too early. And we need, we need the time to find out what our purpose in life is. And when we start to fulfill our purpose, we become a blessing to other people. That is true. Well, I feel this way that uh, if we can just bring it together and get our youth to understand that cutting and killing in each other is not Amen. the way to be. Yeah. There you go, brother. And lift their pants up from their behinds. Have pride in themselves. Mm -hmm. And you, if you have pride in yourself, you're going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Be thankful. Listen to your parents. Listen to your teachers. And get a good education because that is what is good. And it'll be even more so in the years to come, because mm -hmm. we're living in a technical world. Yeah. You, you, as a salesman, um, you work not only on salary but got a commission. Yes. At the close of every transaction. Right. And a lot of people think they want to get a job and just go to work, and that's it. But your mindset is to go beyond what has been offered and to excel and you did that as a salesman um, selling cars and who were some of the people you, you, t you said you sold a car to um, former well, well then police officer um, well, um, Benjamin Ward Ben Ward right he ended up being the chief of police of New York eight million people which is fantastic but I'll tell you how this came about. I was sitting in the office one day and it was raining very rough, no one was coming in. And we were always called car salesmen. And I said, look, I don't want to be just a normal individual. I said, now, in the bars you have mixologists. <laughs> and you have cardiologists. I'm going to start with Freeman Dictionary. Now I'm putting in the word automologist. A U T O M O L O G I S T. Love and from that day, of course, I was known as an automologist. And everyone would ask me, what is an automologist? They'd get Freeman's Dictionary and find it out. That's being comical, of course. <laughs> And uh, I describe it as a person that has complete knowledge of automobiles, the functions, and how to reconstruct the car. So with that, um, I was in the office one day, 1965. A fellow from Lincoln came in. I was working for Lincoln at the time. And he said, guess who came in and bought a car for his wife today? I said, who? He said, Sammy Davis. I said, what? He says, yeah. I said, you got his number? He says, yeah. I said, give it to me. He gave me Sammy's number. I don't know why I did this. Walked over, picked up the phone, dialed his number. So, uh, my Britt, he was married to my Britt at the time. She answered the phone. Mm -hmm. I says, uh, may I speak to Mr. Davis? 
she said, who's called? And I says, uh, Tom, that's uh, Mr. Freeman from Lincoln Division. So Santa came to the phone. Yes? I said, Mr. Davis, let me be the first to congratulate you on purchasing a car for your wife and welcome you to the family of Ford. Yes. And I said, so much so that I want to make a car available for you to see if you like the Lincoln. Yeah? I said, yeah. He says, when, when, when? I said, well, I can have a car for you tomorrow. He says, oh, hey, look, I'm doing two bar mitzvahs tomorrow. Can you make it in the morning? I said, yes. I said, I'll be there tomorrow morning. I hung up the phone and I said, oh, what the hell? What did I do? What did I do? What did I do? I grabbed the phone real quick. I called Cedarboro, New Jersey, which was Lincoln Division. I says, uh, hello, this is uh, J.T. Freeman from McKenzie, Lincoln, America. And I said, I have the opportunity to sell Sammy Davis for Lincoln, but I need a car for him. The guy said, you, you, you can sell Sammy a car? I said, yes. He was just as enthused as I was. He said, well, what do you need to do? I said, well, I promised him let him use the car for a week, starting tomorrow morning. Okay. I have a deal, a oh, yeah. job of that tomorrow, but boy, my heart, the load fell off me like everything, yeah. because after I did this, I said, what am I going to do? Suppose the guy tell me I can't have a car, and I'm going to let you quit sending me. So next morning, 9 o'clock, a guy pulls up, he comes up, had on gray uniform with boots on like a Gustav guy, oh. says, uh, I'm here to see Mr. Freeman. When I stood up, he did like this. Because, you know, by the name Freeman, right. he thought you were Jewish. thought I was Jewish, you know. <laughs> so, I stopped. He, says, he says, you're going to San Yes. What's the address? At uh, 93 uh, East 95th Street. Okay. Goes out, opens the door for me, and I get in the back seat. We take off of Manhattan. We get to Manhattan. 93rd is right near 5th Avenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. He pulls up, gets out, comes open the door for me. And I get out and I walk over and I ring the bell. Myra answered the bell. And I says, uh, Mr. Freeman from the Lincoln Division. She says, Hun, Mr. Freeman is here from the Lincoln Division. He said, Okay, babe, I'll be down in a minute. She said, Come in, will I have a cup of tea? I says, Yes. So I'm sitting there drinking tea. Boom, 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 here comes Sammy down. When he gets down, gets down, step, he Oh, he said, no, 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 I didn't do that. Oh, how could I do a thing like that? Well, I'm sorry, man, come on, you hug me. Because he expected me to be a Jewish guy. Right. Right. But he said, this black dude here, and he did a double take. So he said, man, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I just wasn't with that. I should never do that. I said, I'll forget about it, man. I said, that's happened before. So he said, what are you doing today? I said, nothing. He said, look, I got a couple of bar mitzvahs. You want to hang? I said, yeah, man, I'll hang with you. So we went and we did a bar mitzvah. Then he did another bar mitzvah. And by that time, it's time for him to go and do a show. He was doing Golden Boy at the time. Oh, yes. Lola Falani. Yeah, Lola Falani. There she is right here. Mm. And... Uh, so uh, we hung out. Then after we uh, did, he did the show. Then we went up to Red Randolph's in Harlem. And uh, then uh, we just started hanging out there. And I hung out with him. Mm -hmm. So on the third day of hanging out, I said, you know, I should do a car for you. He said, yeah, what kind of car? I said, we just came out with a four-door Lincoln convertible. And uh, I think it'd be nice. Of he said, "Yeah, go ahead and do it." So I got him a Lincoln, painted burgundy, took the glove compartment out. He liked bourbon and scotch. Had the guy go in the hood, put a container of bourbon, a container of scotch, and one brandy. Three gold jiggers, mm -hmm. spike coming into the glove compartment. And all you do is push a button and it measure out one jigger. Wow. 
And boy, when I took that car to him, he went crazy. Oh man, you out of sight. And then we really got tight. And we hung out and we did a lot of things together, messing around. And, and Lola Falanda, she was fabulous as she wants to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the word got out I designed the car for, for Sammy Davis. And as I said, at that time he was doing Golden Boy. Yeah. So then uh, James Brown was coming to the Apollo Theater. Mm -hmm. And I said, let me go up and see him. So I walk up and uh, Sandy Ray was at the door. He was a little short guy. Mm -hmm. So I knocked on the door. He came to the door. He said, I said, I'd like to see Mr. Brown. He said, who is it? I said, tell him it's Mr. Freeman from Lincoln Division. And uh, James heard it. He said, that's that dude that did the call for Sam. Let that dude in. <laughs> yeah. So I go in. And he said, man, I hear you, you, you did the call for the heavy. I said, yeah, I did. He says, uh, have a seat, have a seat, seat. So I said, I like your getting on the good foot. And I saw him come some of his records, and we talked. And he says, you know, I live right, where do you live? I said, I live in Springfield Garden. Oh, man, I live right around the corner. I live on 175th and Linden. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, you got to stop by. So, we sat there and it turned out it's time for him to go on the show. So he went and did the show, and that was that. So a couple of days later, I happened to be riding around and I seen him pulling into his driveway there. The driveway was on 173rd. Mm -hmm. So I stopped, hey, Mr. Brown, because James, everybody, everybody was Mr. knew him. You, but yeah, yeah, but you, you didn't say James, James Brown, and he didn't call you by your name, Mr. So and so. And Mr. Brown, Hey, Mr. Freeman, come on in. And down in his basement, that's 14, that house has 14 bedrooms in it. Mm. And the basement is unreal. And uh, it's a very large basement. He had a black leather all in the basement. So I go in and talk to him. He says, uh, you know, I was out in California the other day and I seen uh, some funny looking car. I'd never seen one before. And I noticed it said front wheel drive. I said, oh, you're talking about the Tornado. Mm. Is that what yes, it is? Yes, yes, I said, yes, 1957. I said, 1967. I said, yes, the Tornado. He said, I like that thing. You did, you did a thing for, for Sammy Davis. What do you want to do with that? Give me one to do something with it. So he hands me a check. So a uh, $10,000 check he gave me. Card didn't cost me, but I believe it cost seven. $6,200. So I take the check and I call up an Oldsmobile dealer and ask me, he said, yeah, I got a gold one. I said, a gold one? I don't need a gold one. He says, uh, it's been said and I'll give you a good deal. I said, okay. So I bought the gold one and took it over to uh, Linda. I'm married. There's a body shop on Merrick. Well, you know what those president houses are there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right there, it was a body shop. He's still there now. He's doing a fabulous job there now. If you go to a lot of cars, so I went over there with the car and I says, uh, I want this car painted. He said, what color do you want it? I says, uh, cherry red. So he painted the car. And after he got the car finished, there was a black dude a couple of blocks up. He had a, a vinyl shop. And I took the car up there and I said, I want you to do something to this guy. I said, what do you want to do? I'll show you the car in a few minutes. And I had the top all on it, down, came around, made a curve, and came down the back of the fender. And then I read it, went on the back of the tunnel, it was flat in the back like this. And I put on that JB, see it black, see it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And put that on it. And when I took that car off him, he went crazy. And from then on, he said, I'm putting you on my payroll. Oh. <laughs> and what happened when James appeared at the Apollo Theater, Shipman didn't get the money. 
James mm. Brown took, we took over the Apollo Theater. Every penny that came in, came in through us. Wow. He had paid Shipman, and so on the Apollo at right. the time. He paid Shipman to the use of the Apollo. And Danny Ray, myself, Charles Bobbitt, we checked the box to make sure the money was right and everything. And James never carried a penny. The only thing he had is a hundred, he had a hundred dollar bill by his uh, his uh, driver's license. He always kept a hundred dollar bill in there. Because one night we was leaving the Apollo Theater, and by four o'clock in the morning, James decided I had sold him a Mercedes convertible. He decided to do 105 miles an hour across the Grand Central Parkway. Wow. And, and they cops, got him. Cops got stopped him. him. And what James did, he got his license registration, and he pulled out his license for turned dollars there first. And the cops said, oh, you're James Brown. Oh, go ahead. He didn't even give him the money right. because the guy appreciated what he's doing in those days because he was very popular then. And uh, I had uh, from 1964 to the time he left New York, I was with him. From 1964 to 72, he moved out of the house in 72. Mm -hmm. He offered to sell me that house for $50,000. Oh, man. And you couldn't give me that house. <laughs> How you met Al Sharpton? Al Sharpton. Oh. <laughs> this was planned. It's, you go back and look at the video. There is no such thing as an airplane hitting the Pentagon. No. Because you you know what an airplane looks like. So if I nosedive a plane into a building, do you expect to see a round hole? Right. Or do you expect to see that impact mark from the nose of the plane and then a strike mark from the wings? Right. They have a round hole. Mm -hmm. That wasn't an airplane that hit the building. Mm -hmm. And you never saw the fuselage. You never saw anything on the exterior of the, the building. Where the engines? And you had no evidence of anything going through the right. building. Right. So an airplane never hit the building. Right. So 9-11 is a hoax if you're dumb enough yeah. to get caught up in the emotion of what happened. Yes, the people died. That's real. But the question is, who really did it? No airplane is hijacked in this country that the U.S. Air Force does not respond to immediately with three to five jets to bring that plane out. Immediately. Another thing, as I said before, let's take the school. These guys came over to want to learn how to fly. Okay. I'm teaching you to drive a car to simplify it. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, you start to uh, go back to the old days. You start the car up, put the clutch in, put them first, go for it, second and third. Now when you get ready to stop, you take and put your foot on the brake. Now these cats come over, they teach them to fly, but not to land. <laughs> okay? Now if you don't even, if you're not being taught how to land, how are you going to get out? Taking off is the easy part. Yeah. Landing is the hard yeah. part. But they're not taught to land. Nothing was taught to them about landing. So somewhere someone was getting paid or doing something that they want this to be a happening. Those guys weren't even on the plane. You oh. see this? Mm -hmm. You can fly any commercial aircraft with this from here. Mm -hmm. The DOD has done it. All right? So when you get on a commercial air flight, you ain't at the mercy just of the pilot. If the DOD wants to take over that plane, they can do it from here. All right? So even if those guys were thinking, well, yeah, let's do this with this, facilitate it. Yeah. We can override anything that's going on the plane, and we can fly that plane into any target we want. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they did it. Yes. The plane that went down in Pennsylvania, yeah. I was at a crash site here at JFK in July 30th, 1975, runway 22 left, a plane crashed at JFK. I was there. Now, you're going to have a few things. You'll have, if it nose dives, you're going to have an impact crater. Right. If it comes down and strafes the ground, you're going to have a trench. Right. You don't have litter scattered across eight miles. That's an explosion. That's right. The plane that went down to Philadelphia didn't go down. It was 
It was we shot that plane down. That plane never crashed. You know the other one? And there were no parts to the plane that were bigger than a square foot. You know another one? How about Long Island? That one over there too. Yeah. They seen the. T I have a friend, a German friend, lives out there in the beach. His daughter was walking the dog on the beach that night. Mm. She said she's seen. Now this is a German. Seen a, a plane going over and an explosion. They now have a big park out there. Mm -hmm. Got a big park with all the people. Memorial blasted, and everything. Uh, everything right there. The beach, I think, is about five miles out, and they brought it all in and put it. Right. And, and it's amazing to go there. Have you ever been there? No, I haven't been uh, there. I've seen it on television. Uh, yeah. If you ever have a chance to go out there and look at it. It's every nationality that was in that plane, there's a flag there represented. I have quite a few friends in aircraft, mm -hmm. and they take me around to these flags. In fact, I belong to it. And uh, sometime in the summer, if you want to see these things, I'll take you out there and show you. And there again, when I talk to people, we don't know anything what's going on in this city. A lot of people, it's surprising. See, it's just like, we have a museum, a gorgeous museum in 110, Air Power Museum. Republic Airport. Yeah, have, Republic. Yeah. The average adult have never seen it. Mm. No kid, unless I've taken them, have seen it. It's 60 miles from here there. How can the kid from Queens or New York get out there to see that? When their parents don't know anything about it in the mm. first place. We got a P-51 suspended in the ceiling. We got televisions showing every event that the Tuskegee Airmen flew, showing the movie the bombs being thrown. Mm. We got a history of all the guys, what they did. Every Tuskegee Airman. I got to go. OK. I'm going to leave you all in good hands. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we got to leave soon because it's, was it, it's three, is it after yeah. three o'clock? Uh, uh, three thirty. It's almost exactly three thirty. Exactly, three twenty-nine. Mm. <laughs> we do. I got it. We do a second half. We can come back. We can come back. Yeah, because I got to do, I got to take him back to Hall. I got and you. And back to Brooklyn. But I told you how this was going to work. I told you. I said, you, you could enjoy yourself, but it's so much, and we're enjoying you as well. And I'm going to get back to you about some of the stuff I have. Okay. And get it to you. Okay. Um.